Hey, it's Mike here, and today, eating more meat equals longer life expectancy. We're gonna look at a recent February 2022 study out of Australia making this claim, as well as the subsequent news blast that always occurs, and at least 10 of you emailed me saying, oh, we know, one of my meat-loving relatives sent me this as cannon fodder, which was bolstered by how it's a massive study of 170 countries, and there doesn't appear to be any animal industry funding. So we're gonna investigate the study in detail, and there are many red flags, some of which are laughable, and we're also gonna put it up against another February 2022 study on meat and life expectancy. We're gonna have a study showdown, so let's just get into it. As you could guess, this immediately resulted in those articles that are essentially meat propaganda, like this one from the National Hog Farmer, which really scientifically inappropriately has a causal claim that study shows eating meat extends human life expectancy worldwide. It extends it into this one. You have to have the sorry vegans in the title because there's definitely a huge market and increase in shares if you can relieve some of the cognitive dissonance that is created from vegans just existing. But let's get to the basics of the main study, which is this one again out of Australia that looked at 170 countries. It was published in the International Journal of General Medicine. Their website, I'm gonna say, looks kinda crappy, but that shouldn't matter too much unless you live in the West Pacific. <laughs> I always love basing my life dietary decisions off studies with typos. The result was, quote, worldwide bivariate correlation analysis revealed that meat intake is positively correlated with life expectancies. And they say it held strong after adjusting for other factors, which we are going to look at in detail. Though it is worth mentioning that entire regions of the world, like Africa, did not have a strong correlation value at under 0.3. In my last video, I accidentally said a perfect correlation value was 0.1, when I meant to say 1.0. That is perfect, zero is no correlation, negative one is perfectly negative. So you can see that Southeast Asia was down around zero, which would be no correlation at all. That being said, the global total was still correlated, but let's move into the showdown study, this other one from February, 2022, from the journal PLOS Medicine. As you could probably guess, this study went under the radar for your meat loving uncle, probably because it came to the same conclusion that we've seen over and over again over the years, that increased meat consumption equals lower life expectancy. And they looked at other foods in terms of longevity as well, and their conclusions there were that the largest gains for life expectancy would be made by eating more legumes, whole grains, nuts, and less red and processed meat. And what I would consider a moderate reduction in red and processed meat alone would give somebody over three years of extended life, four years if you're a male. Heck, that's enough extra lifetime to get a master's degree, or at least it should be, but in terms of my MPH doing it so slowly, I wasn't able to, but I'm almost done. I'm getting there, a couple more classes. Anyway, add the extra life from eating more plants than you have. New sources like Science Daily stating that changing your diet could add up to a decade of life expectancy, study finds. And where did they look? Well, they looked at the Global Burden of Disease study, which had 195 countries during the time period they looked at it for, but they said they rejected studies that didn't have high quality enough lifestyle data because more countries is not always better, especially if it's not good data. We're about to hop over to that Australian study again, but a couple more points worth mentioning quickly. No conflict of interest or funding from any industries in this study either. And then it's also a huge point it is not just a meta-analysis, but it's a meta-analysis that included other meta-analyses. This is important because mistakes made by a single study in a single study can become very big, but when you have a meta-analysis, if somebody made some adjustment mistakes for different lifestyle factors, those could be drowned out. So what you don't want is like a single cross-sectional study that is only adjusted in one style, and that brings me to, yes, back to that Australian study. That's just a cross-sectional study and looking to the hierarchy of scientific evidence, this pyramid, you can see that cross-sectional studies much lower on the pyramid in terms of quality of evidence than meta-analyses. An impact factor or the influence of a journal isn't everything, but it's worth mentioning here that the Australian Studies Journal has an impact factor of around two and the PLOS Medicine meta-analysis has an impact factor of 11. This brings me to the largest point when it comes to epidemiological studies, and that is, of course, you've heard it a million times, correlation does not equal causation. And I do have to give not the news articles, but the researchers a little bit of credit here because they at least said 
quote, this correlation might not necessarily be valid at an individual level. And we're about to get into the potential problems with the way they just compared entire countries because there are just so many different factors here. But a perfect example of, of course, correlation not being causation and that problem as well brings me to their table that just cross correlates things. And yes, it appears that obesity is positively associated with life expectancy. So what, obesity makes you live longer? Well, no, as we know, severe obesity, at least from the CDC, is likely gonna slash 14 years off of your life. You know, we all know this and it's a good example of a main flaw of this study. And that flaw is the disconnection of actual individual meat consumption throughout the population and instead just looking top down at how much meat the entire country is eating and what the different factors like GDP are for the entire country. And if you remember one thing from the study, it's that there is no direct data connection between how much meat individuals are eating and how long that individual lives. That is where the manipulation can occur. So now we have to look at what they adjusted for. In the past, I have pointed to over adjusting for problems. And so let's just see what they did. They say, quote, this relationship is independent of the effects of caloric intake, socioeconomic status, obesity, urbanization, and education. And the first thing that sticks out, the most powerful correlation numbers and visuals for meat are just completely unadjusted like this chart. In the past, I've pointed to over adjusting as a problem when a value of two can become 2.5 when dealing with variables like BMI. But in this correlation model, they didn't use adjustment. They did what's called a multiple regression analysis to see if other variables are responsible. You see if the factor meat here, for example, is still significant when throwing other variables in, in this case, it is, but there can still be major flaws and it's only as good as the variables you throw at it. We'll get to those flaws in a second. But when you actually look at the multiple regression charts, when meat is removed from all the variables, there's hardly a difference in the correlation power, which implies that, you know, this isn't a super powerful marker itself. And for example, in a regression analysis of 100 countries that included education data, meat isn't even statistically significant for life expectancy at birth. And while GDP does have a reasonable correlation here, I had to refilm this section because it became clear to me just how much the GDP part is an issue here because they looked at GDP PPP, which is purchasing power parity, where you're looking at the wealth of an entire nation then paired with the US dollar at a certain point in time to see how much purchasing power of goods you would have across countries. And that might sound good, but you realize that GDP is super dependent, mostly on the population size of the country. So you can have countries with lower GDP just because they're smaller that have way higher quality of life, you know, like Nordic countries, for example. You know, another example, we have Canada, which has universal healthcare, which actually has a lower GDP PPP than Mexico. And for a really extreme example, Denmark regularly tops the rankings for best healthcare system in the world. Well, its GDP PP is lower than Iraq. So not only do we have the problem that they've completely disconnected meat consumption with personal socioeconomic status, but they didn't even use a better marker like either just GDP per capita or median income, also PPP, parodied up. Unfortunately, there's only lists of like 40 countries when you're looking at that metric, but that brings me to a perfect example of once again, why looking at their GDP metric they did was bad because India is number three on their metric, but actually ranks last in terms of that median income PPP for the countries that we have available. So how would this affect things? I believe that it would throw a bunch of meaningless statistical noise in by which you can use that to exaggerate the actual relationship that meat has because it's an insane relationship in terms of wealth and the actual life expectancy you have. From China, from this study out of Wuhan, <laughs> coincidentally, each luxury item that one possesses resulted in an associated 7% decreased risk of dying during that study. And as I've mentioned before, in India, we can see a threefold difference in death rate between the richest and poorest citizens. So my concern here is that meat availability, since meat is a luxury, essentially a modern luxury, is just a really good marker for how developed a country is. It's gonna be a representative of their healthcare system and how good their healthcare system is. It's gonna be a representation of infrastructure and on and on and on. 
And the same thing can be said for obesity. If you have the resources to have obese people, it's unhealthy, yet you can still make it look healthy through correlation. So what happens when you have a meat and mortality study where they actually account for socioeconomic status? And that brings me to this NIH funded Journal of the American Medical Association Internal Medicine Study, which looked at the nurses health study and the health professionals follow-up study combined. And the point here is that they all have roughly the same socioeconomic status. So you're controlling for that right off the bat. And small side detail, this journal has 10 times the impact factor of the Australian Studies Journal. Well, that study's finding was, quote, red meat consumption is associated with an increased risk of total cardiovascular disease and cancer mortality. Substitution of other healthy protein sources for red meat is associated with a lower mortality risk. They also did account for that healthy user bias by adjusting for things like exercise. And that's what the Australian authors criticize, saying that's been a failure to remove the influence of lifestyle in these studies, which has been heavily criticized. Yeah, in low carb circles. Anyway, here are all of the things that they adjusted for in that study. And finally, from their conclusion, and this really is shocking, quote, we also estimated that 9.3% of deaths in men and 7.6% in women in these cohorts could be prevented at the end of follow-up if all the individuals consumed fewer than 0.5 servings a day of red meat. So yeah, destroyed. Now let's move to what had me baffled about the Australian study, and that is a lot of times there's a direct line boom, right there in the funding section to the beef checkoff or something like that. But in this case, they claim no conflicts of interest. But I can't help but think of that one British medical journal choline study by Emma Derbyshire that was like, oh, no conflicts of interest. Then it was revised to have some more by like the meat industry. And pretty soon you have a paragraph of the meat industry, the choline industry, etc. But we can give them the benefit of the doubt and say that funding perhaps wasn't the situation, but was there perhaps personal bias that could have affected things here? And I do believe there was for many, many reasons. The first of which just has to do with some of the language they were using in the news articles. First, I saw a statement about how it really needed to be like demonstrated that meat was more nutritious or that these carbohydrate foods had less nutrition. Okay, and then, you know, a comment about how humans have adapted to eating meat by one of the authors and oh yeah, they did write a paper about human adaptations to meat, ironically setting heme iron absorption, which is one of the carcinogenic factors from the WHO. And that on its own, no big deal. But then when you crack open the study, there is just seemingly biased point after biased point, often, you know, kind of played like devil's advocate. Like it has been argued, but clearly that is their position. For example, they just have a ton of appeal to nature, meat made our brains grow stuff. I have a very recent video on a study showing that during the main period of time where brains grew to make us human, quote unquote, there was no increase in animal meat consumption anyway. That aside, there's random sketchy claims like, quote, the Seventh-day Adventist cohort has been over-researched in order to demonstrate the relationship between vegetarianism and life expectancy. And it has been argued that vegetarianism and veganism form a part of trendy Western consumerist lifestyles. Just playing devil's advocate. There are also some ideological contradictions that are self-serving, for example. They're like, oh, all of this epidemiology showing that meat is bad. It was not randomized control trials. It was epidemiology that can't really show what's going on. And then, oh, our own cross-sectional epidemiological study, quote, unequivocally indicates that meat eating benefits life expectancy independently. And this next thing, frankly, very laughable, set off major low carb meat loving alarms, was that in defense of meat not being associated with negative health effects, they actually cited Nina Teicholt's book, which is essentially a saturated fat conspiracy denial book. It's not scientific material and it's lacking scientific citations for what it's claiming. And that's just the beginning of a saturated fat denial spiel, citing a paper and other papers that rely on dairy industry funded science to make their case. This opinion paper titled Fat or Fiction, the Diet Heart Hypothesis Hypothesis, which goes after Ansel Keys, you know, saturated fat raises cholesterol, causes heart disease thing, which low carbers love to attack. But as we know, and is echoed by the European Society of Cardiology, I pretty much mention it every video, high LDL is causally linked to atherosclerosis. But it even comes down to some horribly cherry picked 
research as well. For example, they have this claim defending the carcinogenic nature of meat, saying, oh, the nitrate connection wasn't really there, citing the WHO's paper, which makes the case for it being a carcinogen for various reasons like heme iron, or as they say, the genotoxic heterocyclic aromatic amines and the strong mechanistic evidence for colorectal cancer and on and on. Now, I think they would be a little bit mad if I just used their paper to make the claim that meat consumption is associated or correlated with obesity, which in their correlation table here, you can see that it is pretty moderately correlated. But this is where there's a little bit of a wrench thrown in the gears in determining the true bias of the research team. And that's because there are two researchers here that know better than anybody that obesity and meat are heavily associated because they wrote the paper on it. Looking at the same 170 or so countries, they found that meat consumption explains between 13 and 50% of obesity, depending on how many adjustments you make, leading them to conclude that, quote, the country authorities may advise people not to adopt a high meat diet for long-term healthy weight management. But I don't know if there was a shift in attitude or something somewhere, but as was shown on Beef Central's article, Wen Peng Yu, one of the researchers on both papers, said we wanted to look more closely at research that has shown a negative spotlight on meat consumption in the human diet. And based off the tenses of that statement, it makes it seem like it might be kind of a premeditated study to make meat look good. Another flaw I think has to do with just how the factory farming industry has exploded in the last few decades and how that can lead to some disease delay and also different habits between the older and younger populations, which can affect things. Back to the Wuhan study, it's clear that older people are still eating less meat. They're the ones that are gonna show up in the longevity data. And from this chart, you can see the more older people you have in your household, the less meat is consumed. And it's also worth mentioning that since the mid 90s, the meat consumption in all of China has doubled. And of course, cardiovascular disease and these other diseases like colorectal cancer take a while to develop and affect a population. So it's possible that this boom in meat consumption is going to lead to a massive dive in longevity in the next 20 or 30 years. Now, the people who are dying today grew up, were raised, and through middle age ate way more plants than are currently being represented through the data that they got from the FAO. And to support this notion, this is what happened with the French paradox. People thought, oh, these French people are eating all this butter, yet their heart disease rate is sort of out of the trend line, it's lower, but the reality was that they had recently started eating way more saturated fat and butter, and heart disease takes a while to catch up. Well, it did catch up, and they popped right back into line in addition to just properly reporting heart attack deaths as well. And I wanna be fair and say that, yes, some of the criticisms that I've hurled at this Australian study can also be hurled at that PLOS One study showing that, hey, meat was bad for life expectancy, but because that was a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, any mistakes that were made in terms of adjustments are likely not made by every single group of scientists. They can be washed out. That makes it way less likely that you're gonna have a detrimental mistake ruining everything like could happen in a single cross-sectional study, hint, hint. Anyway, it's also worth mentioning the Australian study looked at carbohydrate foods. Well, they found no correlation for life expectancy and it's quote, poor people's food in terms of the global patterns. They also happen to include refined sugars in there as well. Well, looking to the PLOS medicine study, whole grains were associated with a strong increase in life expectancy, and that is corroborated by other mortality and whole grain studies showing a positive relationship. Anyway, I think it's useful to just look at a final table here comparing these studies in the showdown. On the left, we'll have, let's just call it the meat bad study, and on the right, we'll call it the meat good study. For the meat bad one, the results match previous science. For the meat good one, they are the opposite of previous science, which should be a major red flag. They were both published in the same month of the same year. The meat bad one was a meta-analysis, and the meat good one was, of course, just cross-sectional. The meat bad one used high quality data countries only. The meat good one used 170 countries, so more countries, but not necessarily quality. Neither of them had industry funded studies. 
The meat bad one didn't have any biased language like they used in this one. You can read through it yourself and that's very clear. However, the pro meat one had literally ideological rants essentially about saturated fat, the anthropological evidence for carnivory and carcinogenic stuff and on and on. And finally, the meat bad study had straightforward peer reviewed citations or credible databases making up all of the reference list. When you have these wonky cherry picked things of the WHO, as well as citing things like Nina Teichelt's conspiracy low carb book. And a final cool thing I wanna mention about the PLOS Medicine study was that they ended up making a little calculator so that you can look at these different foods and how much they would affect life expectancy in their model. You know, if you were to throw somebody who's eating 12 ounces a day of meat on a keto-based diet and bring them down to zero, that would add six years to their life. I also like this because I was wondering about eggs in there, how it was sort of trending in their forest plot to lower life expectancy, but they never brought it down to zero. Well, I can just simply bring it from something like three eggs down to zero and you are gonna have a, you know, about four years of life added to the total. In the end, there are several weaknesses of this study. Not only was it in a lower tier journal, it was not a meta-analysis, it was just cross-sectional. And there really is just language that is dripping with a low carb pro meat narrative throughout the whole thing, which makes me think that this could have been biased and thought of in advance and then made true later. And even if that isn't the case, a group of researchers could simply accidentally fail to take into account the development rate of different countries, how that has to do with healthcare systems, how that has to do with longevity, see that these countries are eating more meat, and you know, play with the data a little bit and go, oh wow, meat increases lifespan. Well, obesity increases lifespan too, if you wanna say that. And I also have to reiterate that that country down perspective just has a lot of flaws from socioeconomic oversimplification where you're ignoring inequality within the country to the shifting that's recently happened toward meat that could have a disease delay, the different habits of elderly versus young people and on and on. But finally, higher quality studies like meta-analyses in higher quality journals show over and over again that increased meat consumption is associated with worse life expectancy and more mortality over the course of a study. So sorry, meat lovers, sorry, National Hog Farmer, sorry, beefcentral.com. Uh, yeah, meat is not a longevity food. You know, one of the main factors in blue zones is that they eat a lower meat, higher whole plant diet over and over and over again. You get the picture. Let me know down below what you think about this. Honestly, you could need a team of researchers to break apart every detail in the study, which I had more time to go into different adjustments that they made and on and on. But that's it for a YouTube video I try to put out every week. And if you want to support this, of course I have a Patreon. You can check that out at the end or down below. And let me know in the comments what you think about all this. And thanks for watching. See you next time.